Good evening, everyone. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of Chess Council of India to invite you here this evening on a Thursday evening. At the outset, I must uh, thank Dr. Anish Krishna, the founder trustee of CCI, and the uh, webinar coordinator, Dr. Vijay Kumar Chinam Chitti, for immediately agreeing to deviate from our usual Thursday evening webinars and do this masterclass with our invitee for this evening, Dr. Bhavan Jankaria. And with that, I would like to introduce him, although he needs no introduction. Uh, however, for some of you who may not know him, he is a consultant radiologist at his center, Picture This in Mumbai, and has a special interest in cardiothoracic radiology. He is extremely well known by uh, most people in India, and it's a great pleasure to have him here on this platform. Uh, he's going to talk to us on uh, HRCT in diffuse lung diseases. So with this, Bhavan, I hand over to you. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Pratibha, and thank you, um, everyone um, in the organization for at CCI for giving me this opportunity, for inviting me here. And um, without any further ado, I'm just going to stop my video and share the presentation, and then we'll just move on with the uh, presentation and just focus on that. So today's um, presentation really is on uh, diffuse lung diseases. And this is not just interstitial lung disease. Today, we have a broader definition of diffuse lung diseases that includes all of these conditions that you see here. Let's start with bronchiectasis. It's one of the simplest diagnoses that we can make. It's an irreversible localized or diffuse bronchial dilatation, and there can be a bunch of etiologies. Bronchiectasis is unique that it is both a clinical disease and a radiological appearance that may or may not be associated with disease. So you can, for example, see bronchiectasis, let's say on a CT scan, but the patient may have no symptoms and it may be an incidental finding. Uh, typically, when we image bronchiectasis, these are the questions that we answer. Now, we're going to focus on the first two, and that's diagnosis and etiology. The primary signs <clears throat> that we use to diagnose bronchiectasis are the airway to artery diameter greater than one. Some measure the inner and some the outer. It doesn't matter lack of tapering of airways and visibility of peripheral airways. So let's look at these. That's the airway to artery diameter. Whenever it's more than one, now whether you measure outer or inner, it makes no real difference here. And you can typically, as we grow older, the ratios reach up to one. Nobody measures, we just eyeball, we look at it and you know that the bronchus is larger than the artery and that's pretty much the way that we diagnose. The signet ring sign clearly is where you have the uh, artery white and then you have the ring part here, uh, which is the black bronchus and that's why the sign was named. Lack of tapering is when... Um, two centimeters after the bifurcation, you don't have reduction in the diameter. So typically, when the bronchus branches, it should keep tapering. And when it doesn't, you know that the walls have become rigid. And this is an associated sign of uh, bronchiectasis. Again, nobody measures. Once you get used to the sign, you just eyeball it and that's fine. Visibility of peripheral airways in the last two centimeters of the lungs is also a sign of bronchiectasis. Again, you'd only measure if you're doing a study or a trial, but not in clinical practice. Then we have the secondary signs of wall thickening, mucoid impaction, and associated uh, tree and bud, which we would then define as inflammatory or infectious bronchiolitis, and then associated air trapping or constrictive bronchiolitis, which we will talk about <clears throat> when we talk about small airways disease. So wall thickening is the thickening of the wall of the dilated bronchus. Normally, the normal wall is imperceptible. So the moment you actually see thickening, you know it's there. 
Mucoid impaction is diagnosed when on the lung windows, we see two white areas uh, next to each other. Plus, when you have the entire scan, you can trace the bronchus and the fact that the black bronchus is now replaced by a white area. So, you know, it's mucoid impaction. And when we see distal tree in bud, <clears throat> you know that there is associated inflammatory or infectious bronchiolitis. And so that uh, pretty much... Uh, uh, helps us make the diagnosis. We also know that traction bronchiectasis is a term used for a condition where in the presence of interstitial lung disease, we have dilatation of the bronchioles. We also talk about parasicatricial bronchiectasis that occurs following infection, such as tuberculosis. So these are other forms to know about. And I've just summarized <clears throat> the primary and the secondary signs here on a single slide, just so that it becomes easy to understand um, what and how, in a way, easy it is uh, to diagnose bronchiectasis. Once we've diagnosed it, in some instances, we may find, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm going to apologize for my voice, the AQI in Mumbai, for those of you who live in Mumbai almost as 250 to 300 these days. We live in a very polluted environment and <clears throat> my throat has been bad for the last two weeks. Those of you who live in the mountains or in less polluted areas, damn good for you. Anyway, so <clears throat> sometimes we can make out an etiology and this was the paper by Raja and colleagues that they published in Lancet Global Health and they showed the the incidences of the various etiologies of bronchiectasis in our country. Let's look at three or four of these. This is a situation where you have a young patient who has predominantly mid and lower zone bronchiectasis, mucoid impaction and distal inflammatory bronchiolitis. So it's right middle lobe, lingula and both lower lobes. And that's why I use the term mid and lower zone. Now, this distribution is typical of primary ciliary dyskinesia. And this patient had a confirmed genetic diagnosis of PCD. Now, when the PCD occurs with dextrocardia, then we are more confident in our diagnosis because then we can diagnose cartagenous, which is a subset of PCD and occurs in about 17 to 20% of patients with PCD. But again, you can see that it's right middle lobe, lingula, and lower lobe disease. So bronchiectasis, mucoid impaction, inflammatory bronchiolitis, and all of that together. More commonly in our country, we have patients with asthma and bronchiectasis. And here we have this proximal central bronchiectasis, which is quite typical of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. The other CT sign that is pathognomonic is the presence of these high attenuation mucus plugs and they go along the dilated bronchi. So we get these gloved finger and V and Y shaped opacities. Now this is considered to be an immune response to aspergillus and there are a bunch of clinical laboratory and radiologic criteria that allow us to make the diagnosis. Now, you can also see this gloved finger appearance on radiographs. In this particular patient, you can see this high attenuation mucus plug in the anterior segment of the upper lobe. And then distally, you have mucoid impaction. And again, a reasonably typical uh, finding of ABPA. Now, this is another etiology, not very common, but a 60-year-old man with long-standing asthma, recurrent infections. You can see the bronchiectasis here. But what is striking is the presence of these diverticulae that I've shown here on these minimum intensity projection images in the trachea as well as in the main bronchi. And this is very typical of Munier Kuhn. Now, Munier Kuhn does normally occur in younger individuals, but sometimes if they've been undiagnosed for many years, you would pick it up when you pick it up. So that's what happens. This condition is not common. <clears throat> we have a 15-year-old with uh, bronchiectasis, and then the pancreas shows atrophy and fat infiltration. So this combination is highly suggestive of cystic fibrosis. So that's as far as bronchiectasis is concerned. Easy diagnosis to make. 
And once we've made the diagnosis as radiologists, we also try and see if there is an etiology. Most of the times we don't find <clears throat> a definitive or a typical etiology because the commonest cause of bronchiectasis would either be viral infection in childhood or tuberculosis. But in the other instances, sometimes we can make an etiologic diagnosis. Then we have emphysema and small airways disease. Emphysema, typically there are three types. We don't see panlobular that commonly. So let's just look at centrilobular and paraseptal. We actually have defined <clears throat> methods of diagnosing different forms of centrilobular emphysema. Let me just show you the examples. It's much easier that way. Now, as when you see a centrilobular lucency without walls adjacent to a vessel, then that's centrilobular emphysema. <clears throat> if the involvement is less than 0.5% of the, of, the, of the area or volume in any segment, then we would say trace. If it's less than 5%, it's mild. If it's greater than 5%, as we see here, then it's moderate. If the centrilobular lucency start coalescing, then it's confluent. If they coalesce and they show increased volumes and expansion, then it's advanced destructive. The same is true of paraseptal emphysema. We'll just straight away look at the um, conditions or the images. Paraseptal emphysema would occur as a single layer of lucency at the periphery. <clears throat> and you can see here that uh, these are the um, uh, walls separating uh, the paraseptal uh, emphysematous changes. But you don't really see a thick wall as, let's say, you would see with honeycombing. And we'll see that example when we look at interstitial lung diseases. So if the size of an individual cyst is less than a centimeter, we call it mild. And when the size in the um, uh, anterior posterior dimension, as we would call it, or side to side um, dimension would be greater than one centimeter, then the term used is substantial. And so I've just put all of this together on a single slide, mild, moderate, confluent, advanced destructive, mild paraseptal, and substantial paraseptal. One of the new things that has now been, that has come up is quantification. And we're able to quantify the extent of emphysema. We're able to quantify the extent of air trapping, as in this patient who has moderate centrilobular emphysema. We can say that there is 3% fixed lucency. We know that there's 43% air trapping. These <coughs> findings are supposed to correlate with the gold stages for COPD. However, we still need more data and research uh, to make this a routine uh, method of um, evaluating CT scans. And that we will only be able to do when we can prove that quantification affects management and prognosis and that it makes a difference uh, to treatment. But it's there and we use it um, whenever we can so that we also start learning how a COPD and emphysema behaves. Small airways disease is when the distal airways are involved. And there are two forms, constrictive and proliferative. Constrictive is when there has been some insult to the terminal bronchiole. And there is airflow limitation because of the fibrosis after that of the terminal and respiratory bronchioles. And these are the various etiologies that produce obliterative or constrictive bronchiolitis. On CT, we need a paired inspiratory-expiratory scan to make the diagnosis. What do we see? So we see these areas of increased lucency. You compare the right to the left, the left is normal. We see fewer vessels. So there's paucity of vessels or reduced vessels. When you have the inspiratory-expiratory pair, you can see the air trapping. See how on the normal left side, there is actually an increasing gradient of whiteness, which you normally see in expiratory scan. So that's all normal lung. And this is air trapping here. This is what gives rise to the so-called mosaic appearance. 
and <clears throat> you may or may not have bronchiectasis. This patient has bronchiectasis in the right middle and lower lobes, but you may not always have it. When the constrictive bronchiolitis involves an entire lobe or an entire lung, as in this patient who doesn't really have a lot of bronchiectasis, but because this is long-standing, you can see that there's reduced volume of the entire left lung and the left pulmonary artery has become very small. So this then is called the Swire James MacLeod syndrome. So now those two conditions or those names, right? You had Swire James and then you had MacLeod's and they just combined all of this into a single name. So it's the SJML syndrome. And it's just a very severe form of constrictive bronchiolitis. So this is what we see with constrictive bronchiolitis. Now, in practice, you may see multifactorial involvement. So now this patient has post-TB changes in the upper lobes. This patient has butchula exposure. And you can see lower lobe overinflation. There, is, there was air trapping on the expiratory images. So we have multifactorial non-smoking COPD, which is not uncommon in women and in our country. And so here we've gone ahead and again quantified and shown 7% fixed hyperlucency, 44% air trapping. What does this mean prognostically? We're not yet sure, but we are trying to track these patients on follow-up as well to see if this can correlate with improvement or not. Now, the other form of constrictive or, or, or uh, airways disease is proliferative bronchiolitis. So think of proliferative bronchiolitis as a wet disease and constrictive bronchiolitis as a dry disease. So in proliferative bronchiolitis, we have some form of inflammation or infection that has the potential to actually produce stenosis and fibrosis and lead to constrictive bronchiolitis. The commonest form of focal proliferative bronchiolitis is tuberculosis, where we see this tree and bud appearance here in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. This is another patient who has disease in the right upper lobe uh, and here in the right lower lobe. And this is very characteristic, right? And it's called tree and bud because you get these branching centrilobular opacities along the distal bronchioles. And the density is a little higher. And while this may occur with other infections as well, in our country, TB is the commonest. Then you have a more diffuse form, which is a little less dense. You can compare with the density here. These are softer lesions, less dense, more at the periphery and bilateral and diffuse. And we call this diffuse inflammatory bronchiolitis. There is no other etiology that we can gather from the CT. Now everything is on history. If the patient is from Korea or Japan, then you use the term diffuse panbronchiolitis. If it's acute, if the patient has rheumatoid arthritis, it could be follicular bronchiolitis. If the same patient is a smoker, then it would be respiratory bronchiolitis. And if the same patient is a little immuno compromised nutritionally, slightly older, it could be NTM as well or non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. All of that can pretty much look the same and it's only on history that we can make that differentiation. So again, to summarize, proliferative bronchiolitis, focal, the commonest etiology is tuberculosis and when it's diffuse, widespread, softer, less dense peripheral lesions, then these are the conditions we would consider. But now the further um, etiologic diagnosis would depend upon the history and the examination findings. We then move on uh, to interstitial lung diseases. So we've covered bronchiectasis, we've looked at emphysema and small airways disease, and we'll spend another 20 or 25 minutes on ILDs. When we talk about ILDs, we have um, about eight signs to look at. Three of them are of the fibrosing ILDs. So we have reticular opacities, traction bronchiectasis and honeycombing. And we have the signs of non-fibrosing ILDs and that would be ground glass, consolidation, septal thickening, 
ill-defined bronchocentric nodules and discrete perivascular subplural or fissural nodules. So now let's come back to the fibrotic ILDs, right? So you have reticular opacities, which are these linear uh, opacities that we see extending up to the pleural surface. Traction bronchiectasis, which is dilatation of the distal bronchioles along with the reticular opacities. And this is a defining feature of a fibrosing ILD. You may or may not get honeycombing in a fibrosing ILD, but it is when you get traction bronchiectasis that you confidently make the diagnosis. Honeycombing is the presence of cysts with shared walls starting in the subpleural region and then extending towards the hilum. So you can have multiple layers stacked one upon the other. And if you remember when I showed paraseptal emphysema, we had thin imperceptible walls, but here you have defined walls because this is because of destruction of the alveoli and the secondary pulmonary lobules. And so you can see the walls that much better. Honeycombing is a specific sign of a fibrosing ILD, but not very sensitive. Now, when you put the signs together is when we start talking about the UIP and the non-UIP, non-IPF patterns. So if we have reticular opacities, honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, subpleural basal predominance, and nothing else, no ground glass, no nodules, nothing else, then that's your typical UIP pattern. The same pattern without the honeycombing would be the probable UIP pattern. So you have reticular opacities, you have traction bronchiectasis, subpleural basal predominance, nothing else. The only thing missing is the honeycombing and that is your probable UIP pattern. Now we have four buckets in our fibrosing ILDs. We won't be discussing the third bucket of indeterminate because that is typically when we don't know what's going on. We shrug our shoulders and say, hey, we don't know. So then that becomes indeterminate. But these two buckets are of your typical and probable UIP. The only difference is the absence of honeycombing. And in both settings, it would imply IPF if there is no etiology. And then you don't really need to do a surgical lung biopsy. But remember that it is IPF, it's idiopathic is the term, right? So that's when you don't have an etiology. How, if you see a 27-year-old with a UIP pattern here and a dilated esophagus, this is not IPF, this is not idiopathic. This patient has scleroderma, so this is scleroderma ILD with a UIP pattern. Here we have a probable UIP pattern, but the patient has calcified pleural plaques. The patient used to work in a brake lining factory. So this is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is not IPF. This is asbestos ILD with a UIP pattern. And I'm trying to make this differentiation because all UIP is not IPF simply because UIP can have etiologies as well. Here, look at this patient, probable UIP, reticular opacities, traction bronchiectasis, subpleural basal predominance, no honeycombing. But this patient has golden hair, is blonde, uh, rather has, has fair skin. Actually, there was ocular albinism. And this is your typical hermansky pudlak syndrome. So this is not IPF. This is a genetic familial pulmonary fibrosis due to a genetic condition called HPS. Then we have the fourth bucket, which is of UIP-like but non-IPF patterns. So what does that mean? We have honeycombing. Right, And so this looks like UIP. But as we go further up, we see that there is an axial distribution. You have lesions going from the hilum to the periphery. We have ground glass. We have other cystic changes. We have a mosaic pattern here. And if you see closely in, some, in this segment, you also see these ill-defined centrilobular nodules. 
And if you remember the definition of typical and probable UIP, it was subplural basal predominance and nothing else. Here we have axial distribution, upper mid zone predominance, and lots of extra masala. So this becomes your non UIP, non IPF pattern. In our country, the two main conditions that produce this would be fibrotic HP and chronic pulmonary sarcoid, of which HP would be much, much more common than pulmonary sarcoid. So this is your non-IPF fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. On the other hand, we have this patient who has an axial distribution. Look at the reticular opacities. There's honeycombing in the upper lobes, non-dependent and extensive traction bronchiectasis, but upper and mid-zone predominant. So it's not subplural basal. And uh, there are additional findings here. So this is again non-IPF. And this pattern of distribution is very typical of chronic pulmonary sarcoidosis. So these are the two major non-IPF conditions. And that makes up your fourth bucket here that we see, which is consistent with non-IPF because there are additional findings. Now, in some instances, you may need a lung biopsy. But again, most of the times when we are able to look at these properly and identify all of these patterns, you don't always need it. Over the last five to 10 years, we've also learned that there are patterns of fibrosis that are highly suggestive of connective tissue disease. And we call these, um, uh, and, uh, we give it an umbrella term called variant fibrosis. And that is when you, for example, have anterior upper lobe exuberant honeycombing, or you have island-like fibrosis, which occurs with SLE and scleroderma. Or on the coronal and sagittal images, we see a straight edge sign. Or when the honeycombing involves more than 70% of a lobe. All of these would ideally be called UIP. But then you may have a younger patient, let's say in the 50s. Or you may have uh, exuberant honeycombing or in the anterior upper lobes or a straight edge and then you turn around or I would turn around and say, hey, you know what, it is UIP-like, there is honeycombing, there is traction bronchiectasis, but these features are highly suggestive of connective tissue disease and even if the patient doesn't have a CTD right now, you just need to investigate and figure out what it is that is hiding inside the patient's body and make that diagnosis, which then brings us to NSIP because that is your archetypical um, <clears throat> condition associated with connective tissue disease. And you can see that your classic NSIP um, would typically be temporal, would show temporal and spatial homogeneity, which means that the lesions pretty much look the same in the segments that you see. And temporally would mean that when you go from top to bottom, there is a change perhaps, but the change is again pretty much similar across the various uh, segments. And so that's temporal and spatial homogeneity. Very often you may get subplural sparing. So while you do see reticular opacities extending up to the pleura, you find that otherwise there is this sparing and this lucency that you see here. And that, again, is very typical of NSIP. Now, NSIP can have both fibrosing and non-fibrosing components, but you can't make that out most of the times on the CT. You can only make that out on follow-up because whatever regresses would have been cellular and whatever doesn't would be fibrosis. We also know that NSIP can precede full-blown connective tissue disease by a few years, but do remember that idiopathic NSIP is extremely rare. In fact, if we term or if we label the patient uh, as having NSIP, almost always the patient either has connective tissue disease or will land up having connective tissue disease in the future. So both variant fibrosis where it looks superficially like UIP, but there are other findings suggestive of CTD and NSIP are the two patterns that we see in connective tissue diseases.
We then move on to the non fibrosing ILDs. And the non fibrosing ILDs are characterized by five signs ground glass, where we have increased density, but it doesn't obscure the underlying vessels. Consolidation, where the underlying vessels are obscured, as here, and you see air bronchograms or bronchiolograms. Septal thickening, which is thickening of the secondary pulmonary lobule. Ill-defined bronchocentric nodules and discrete perivascular fissural uh, subplural nodules, etc. So let's look at ground glass. And we see that here, it's an extremely non-specific sign. We have patchy ground glass, we have spared areas. In some segments, we may see air trapping. And just like with the proliferative bronchiolitis that we saw earlier, further uh, Evaluation depends upon the history. So if the patient has a subacute onset, is a non-smoker woman exposed to pigeons, then the diagnosis would be different. The diagnosis in a smoker would be different. The diagnosis in an HIV positive patient would be different. And these are the various diagnoses we would consider. The same pattern, nothing has changed, but these are the differentials that you would look at depending upon the history and presentation. And this is so true of everything in chest uh, ra radiology that there are very few patterns, maybe overall about 20 or 30 patterns, right? So the lung reacts to insult in a finite number of ways. I mean, you see a consolidation with air bronchograms and normal proximal bronchi. What is it? It's a pneumonia if the patient has fever and raised counts. But if the patient is asymptomatic and has just minimal cough and the consolidation has been there for a year, you would think of invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. If the patient is taking castor oil for 20 years, you might think of a lipoid pneumonia. The same consolidation can be traumatic if the patient has a history of trauma. So all of the Findings. There are a few sets of findings and then everything else depends upon the history. So which is why as radiologists, we are often hamstrung because if we do not know, for example, whether the patient is a smoker or not. Now, if I don't know that this patient is a smoker, how do I make a diagnosis of DIP? If I don't know that the patient is HIV positive, how do I make a diagnosis of PCP, right? So these are important things that we need to be told when the patient comes in for a CT chest. Now, <clears throat> we have this entity of ground glass plus, which means the ground glass is associated with other findings. So when we have ground glass that we see here, subtle, ill-defined, associated with these lobular areas of air trapping, then that typically occurs with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And that brings us to the triple density sign, which was earlier called the head cheese sign, where we see ground glass, that's one density, normal lung, that's the red arrow, and the second density, and lucent lung, the green arrow, the third density, on an inspiratory image. And when we see the triple density sign, the commonest condition that does this is hypersensitivity pneumonitis, where there is both a fibrosing and a non-fibrosing component. But we've now seen, like with everything that happens in medicine, that you can also see the sign in some other conditions. But in the right clinical setting, the triple density sign is quite specific for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The other ground glass plus is ground glass plus consolidation. And this brings us to the various organizing pneumonia patterns. So here you can see consolidation with peripheral ground glass. This is peribronchovascular. This is subplural. Again, you see some consolidation and surrounding ground glass. This is the reverse ground glass. Ground glass in the center and consolidation at the periphery, also called the atoll sign. And here we have this reverse bat swings appearance, but again, ground glass in the center and consolidation at the periphery. And these are all organizing pneumonia patterns. And again, please remember that organizing pneumonia can have multiple etiologies like connective tissue diseases, post chemotherapy, other drugs, um, you know, again, toxic fume, etc.
and it is only when we ruled out an etiology do we use the term cryptogenic organizing pneumonia so since they had used idiopathic earlier for pulmonary fibrosis they said you can't have too many idiopathic so let's change this to cryptogenic which is again another word for idiopathic so instead of saying iop that is idiopathic organizing pneumonia they changed it to cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or cop i mean this is a true story right i mean this is how people do all of these definitions they're drinking red wine they're sitting in the evening uh, post some meeting in a fancy restaurant and and then making all these decisions anyway uh we saw a lot of organizing pneumonia during covid and you can see that here there's consolidation the surrounding ground glass etc so these were all different op patterns that we saw then then we have another ground glass plus which is ground glass plus septal thickening and you can see that here you get this crazy paving pattern and this is very typical of alveolar proteinosis and again alveolar proteinosis can be secondary to underlying diseases or it can be primary in which case the treatment is different but during covid during the height of the first two um, waves we did see these patterns a lot where we saw ground glass and septal thickening and we called it these focal crazy paving patterns this is very different from alveolar proteinosis and it was an easy diagnosis to make <clears throat> so since we've seen ground glass plus septal thickening let's just look at septal thickening on its own so supposing we see septal thickening throughout the lungs which is non nodular perhaps a little bit of perihilar ground glass but more importantly bilateral pleural effusions this is the first slide that i have shown in the last uh, uh, 37 minutes since we started <clears throat> where there is pleural effusion remember pleural effusions and these diffuse lung diseases don't really go hand in hand so when you see this it means that there is volume overload and this was pulmonary edema the patient was given lasix and came back after 36 hours because i wanted to document how these findings can be reversed almost instantaneously with the right treatment but if the septal thickening is just is focal involving just a segment or a lobe and maybe nodular as we see here in the presence of a lung mass then this is lymphangitis and lymphangitis is a diagnosis that we do not make in the absence of a known primary i mean for any of us to uh, diagnose a cancer for the first time in a patient because we look found lymphangitis is so uncommon that it will be probably a once in a lifetime situation then we have nodules which are of two major types the ill defined centrilobular that we see here which is characteristic of non fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and we have the discrete uh, fissural subpleural perivascular sorry perivascular <laughs> subpleural and fissural nodules that we get with sarcoid these fissural nodules are better seen on coronal images and we've learned now in fact when we are interpreting these scans we're looking at axial coronal sagittal all on the same screen so that we can pick up for example that straight edge sign we can pick up these fissural nodules if present and get a better understanding of the distribution of diffuse lung diseases i've made my own chart here to differentiate the different nodules and you can see all of these here um, and they're quite simple and straightforward to remember a few other a couple of other entities that we should know about one is interstitial lung abnormality this is the term that we use when we find incidentally interstitial lesions that involve about 5% of a single lung zone in individuals in whom ild is not suspected that's very important so these days because we do so many ct scans for so many reasons we may find any one of these three categories some non subpleural ground glass some subpleural non fibrotic reticular opacities and some subpleural fibrotic reticular opacities with traction bronchiectasis but 
if these are incidental findings in a patient where we didn't do the scan for ILD, then we use the term interstitial lung abnormality or ILA. Right. Then, so to understand ILA, um, it is important to have this entire clinical situation in mind. Another entity that was recently defined by the ERS ATS in 2022 is progressive pulmonary fibrosis, wherein if we have two scans at least a year apart, and if we see any of these entities where there's increased uh, traction bronchiectasis or new ground glass or new reticulation, increased reticulation, etc., then we use the term progressive pulmonary fibrosis or PPF. Sometimes you don't know what the etiology is, but if you've seen progression, that is enough <coughs> evidence required to start antifibrotics. And so that is the idea of having this definition. The other entity that has had a better definition in 2022 again is uh, combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, where in smokers mostly, but you can also have this in non-smokers, we typically have upper lobe emphysema. Now, this is confluent and advanced destructive emphysema. And we have a UIP-like fibrosis here, but you can have different types of fibrosis. In smoking, you have other entities as well. And when you put all of this together, you get this unique condition called CPFE, which behaves a little differently clinically and perhaps may have a slightly different uh, prognosis as well. So lastly, to round up this presentation, we have the last diffuse lung disease, and that is cystic lung disease. And if you look at... Um, uh, lectures or papers on cystic lung disease, they will have all of these conditions listed and you know you get a little bogged down when you see this. But let's just focus on the four common conditions that occur as only cysts with nothing else. One common condition is pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And this diagnosis we make only in smokers. So if the patient is not a smoker, <clears throat> then typically PLCH doesn't get diagnosed. The Bert Hogg Dubay syndrome is usually an incidental finding where we get elliptical paramediastinal cysts. And these we often see in patients who come for PET CTs, let's say for renal cell carcinoma, colonic and pancreatic cancers, because there is an association between the berthog dubay syndrome and uh, these cancers. And in the BH, we diagnose this by doing the follicle and gene study. And if positive, then you make the diagnosis. <clears throat> if you see cysts in women, in the reproductive age group, and these usually are similarly sized, they are rounded, then we would think of lymphangioleomyomatosis, and we make the diagnosis by measuring raised VGFD levels. Of course, if you have a woman smoker, <laughs> then it becomes a problem because you don't know if it's LAM or PLCH, and we've had that problem on occasion. But smoking cessation, if it results in reduction of the cysts, then you have your diagnosis as well. If you see perivascular cysts in the setting of Sjogren's or in a patient who's HIV positive or some of the other CTDs like rheumatoid arthritis, then you may consider the possibility of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. So these are our four common uh, diffuse cystic conditions. And again, once we've made that diagnosis of cystic disease, everything else depends upon the history, the lab findings. You have to put all of this together and then come to a diagnosis. Lastly, before I end, a word on technique. This is what we need to make a good diagnosis of interstitial lung diseases for bronchiectasis, emphysema, small airways disease and cystic lung disease. The only thing we don't need is the prone study, but we still need the rest of it. Now, I talk to my radiologist colleagues and residents all the time about this, but 
again, if there is no push, if there is no reason to do good scans, why will people necessarily change? So the push has to come uh, from y'all, from physicians who do not, who refuse to accept inferior quality scans. Um, what some of my colleagues in Mumbai have done is they've they've uh, uh, printed these out or this this protocol out without the logo, of course, and uh, circulated it to the scan centers or given it to patients to give it to the scan centers to say that this is what we want. It's not necessarily necessary that the scan center or the hospital department will follow this. But this is the protocol. If it's interstitial lung diseases, volume supine one millimeter scans, volume expiratory scans in the supine position and then prone inspiratory one millimeter scans, you must have soft copy images. And if it's still being documented on films, then it's 12 on one, not 20, not 30, not 50, not 16. If you want to see the lesions well, it cannot be smaller um, than 12 on one. All right. So this is the protocol and you could take a screenshot for this and try and, um, uh, you know, keep it with you to share with patients, uh, etc. So this is what we did today. I looked at, started with bronchiectasis, then talked about emphysema and small airways disease, then interstitial lung diseases, and then cystic lung disease. And this is a basic introduction to how uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, this is what we do daily. This is what our practice is all about. None of this is theoretical. It's all something we do regularly. And I hope uh, this has been useful. In many of the slides, you may have seen ctchestreview.com because I put up a case every seven to 10 days at this site and you can subscribe to it and then you'll get an email with that case uh, automatically. Thank you so much for listening to me and I'm happy to take any questions if there are. There were only two questions, Bhavan, right at the beginning of your talk. I think okay. people are still spellbound and there is so okay. much information that you have given that I think they have run out of questions. But the two questions that were there, one, I think uh, a doctor from Odisha has asked, how do you diagnose autoimmune uh, so that you have already covered with your connective tissue That's disorders. Yes. Answer. And the other uh, question was from Dr. Tridip asking uh, that you need to look at the uh, yes. hyperattenuation mucoid. Yes, that is a yes in the mediastinal window. And on a plain scan, plain because scan. on yes. a contrast scan, you may miss it completely. Correct. So that's probably one of the few uh, conditions where on a plain scan, you will get a hyperattenuated uh, mucus plugging or Sometimes even in a foreign body, right? Sometimes you can have a supari also, which looks like a hyperdense shadow plane scan. Uh, so, a couple of things I uh, ask you about that in your progressive fibrosis slide, you showed a scan which had a very dramatic because I think that was 2016 to 2022. But I guess in reality, uh, it may it could be somebody who has progressed over. Uh, a year who's had some progression on the scan, but other clinical and physiological progression also, which could label him into the PPF criteria. Okay. So just for uh, some of the audience who may wonder that it needs to be a very rapid or a very dramatic change, it need not be a very dramatic change, which is why, I mean, a dramatic change, even all of us would pick up. But I think if it's, which is why we always ask our radiologists, at least uh, the hospitals that I'm attached to, please let me know if there is progression and what is the probability of how dramatic the progression is. Coming well, to that, you, you have not mentioned anything about artificial intelligence in interstitial lung disease. So yeah, I mean, you know, it'll since come we don't eventually. have many questions, yeah, but since yeah. we don't have many questions, I thought maybe if you could just, uh, you know, because there are questions about it because, you know, some centers, including yours, do give us uh, scoring on percentage of ground glass, percentage of fibrosis, vascular involvement. So how is that? Uh, I mean, how? So how that's not uh, AI based. That's actually texture analysis. Texture based, yes. So um, how, how does that work? No, it, it's, it's again, it's training a computer to understand patterns uh, on earlier scans and then to, to come up with all these numbers. Uh, it's still a long way ahead. I mean, even 
caliper, the software that we use, it makes mistakes. And uh, we've seen that it is our it is our subjective analysis that is always superior to the objective measurements, at least at this point in time. It is not rocket science. I'm assuming that sooner or later, uh, a, depending upon the, if the quality of the scan is consistent, we should be able to have some form of AI that could give us a better understanding of the extent of disease and you know help us with all of that. When that will happen, when it will be validated, um, I don't know. It could take five to ten years, maybe less, maybe more. I mean, the the rate of uh, um, uh, change in the AI world is so rapid that you can't really make any predictions these days. Sure. So what I wanted to again highlight is I think uh, what your last slide was about the quality of the scan. You know, I think a lot of times when people come to us, they come with such bad quality scans and, uh, you know, you're expected to make a diagnosis or interpretation based on that. So all of us are not fortunate, to, at least everybody who is probably logged in is not fortunate to have access to you, which I do. But uh, I mean, if they have this kind of uh, computerized thing, when they don't have expert people to assess the scans, should they take any uh, cognizance of the assessment of, uh, you know, the caliper score? Or you think it would be like... No, 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 that's no. even worse. Uh, the that caliper was, right? is yes. done on a poor quality scan. Yes. It makes no sense at all. And <clears throat> I think one of the issues that has occurred with Caliper is that it's been rolled out countrywide. There's some pharma company that's bankrolling it. And you have all kinds of scans that are now being uploaded to get those results. And we've seen a few yes. of those coming in because we've been using it for the last, I think, four, we started in Feb 20, just a month before covid and um, we've had some experience with it. And we've realized that, in fact, if the scan is not perfectly done, you just can't use those caliper scores for anything because it will vary. And then if the next scan is done somewhere else, that you can't compare the caliper scores and two scans done in two different centers. And it's all a big bit of a problem. So... You first have to look at the scan and then you have to interpret the quantification based upon the qualitative findings. So it's a bit of a, an issue there. Uh, I think it's best that if, as, as pulmonologists, I think you once mentioned that nobody looks at x-rays anymore other, other than pulmonologists, right? I think you made yes. that comment to me once. So, <laughs> so I think just like that, I think all pulmonologists are increasingly become better at reading scans themselves. And this, this masterclass was uh, aimed at hoping that, you know, there is more knowledge disseminated out there by you and, and you've done a fantastic job. I mean, I'm telling you, we always have lots and lots of questions whenever we do these sessions, but literally there have been only two questions at the beginning and everybody <laughs> signed There up. weren't too many people who logged in. So I don't know about that. I hope not, but your, this is going to be out uh, later as well for people to see. So That's I'm right. sure it's, it's going to go viral <laughs> even for people who could not log in today. So, you know, it, it, it's something I think you have... Uh, come in, you, you don't know many online webinars, right? Like this extensively. I used to do. We've stopped to doing do most of them. Okay. So it's great that we have managed to get you here. Thank you so much for sparing your time. Um, My pleasure entirely. Thanks, Pratiba. And thank you, everyone from CCI. And uh, yeah, see you, see you somewhere physically. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Bhatan. Thank, thank you on behalf of CCI. And the office bearers, Dr. Ashish Dubey and Dr. Anil Maske, I must thank Bhavan for joining us here on giving us such a wonderful uh, masterclass. And Dr. N.H. Krishna has just messaged that uh, we have had 1,243 logins for this session. So thank you okay. for that. So there are many people who logged in, Bhavan. They're just thank speechless. You. All right. Yeah. See you. Bye -bye. All right. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kirat Sibal and Dr. Uh, Atri Gangopadhyaya, they are the behind the scene people who are coordinating a lot of these things and uh, one must make mention of their names.
and i thank cci for allowing uh, this masterclass to happen and it's been wonderful thank you good night